to presidents of the societies. Um, I am here to um, welcome you to the plenary lecture today. Um, my name is Liz Sykes. I'm the vice president of the Geochemical Society, and it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker, the president of the European Association of Ge Geochemistry, Derek Vance. Dr. Vance is a professor of geochemistry in the Department of Earth Science at ETH Zurich. In his earlier career, Derek worked on mantle geochemistry and used geochronology and metamorphic petrology to understand mountain belts such as the Alps and the Himalayas. For the past 15 years, however, he's focused on understanding the geochemistry of the surface Earth. This has involved quantification of the global cycles of trace elements through his investigations of the inputs into the dissolved pool of the oceans and outputs to various kinds of sediments. An important long-term objective of his is to use this effort targeted at understanding modern budgets to understand the chemical evolution of the surface Earth in the past. Please join me in welcoming Derek back to the podium. Thank you. Thank you, Liz, for that introduction. <clears throat> and thank you to Liz and Sumit and Kevin and Ken and Isabel and everyone else involved with the Geochemical Society for organizing this, uh, what's been a great conference so far. I'm amazed that it's been technically almost seamless. Congratulations. And it's so great to be uh, back together again at a Goldschmidt conference. <clears throat> Right, so my overall theme today is the oxygenation history of the oceans, focusing on the Phanerozoic, so the last 540 million years or so. And this, as many of you, all of you I'm sure know, is one aspect of a really major planetary scale process through the history of the Earth. One that saw the surface Earth move from almost completely anoxic early on to the situation we have today with 21% O2 in the atmosphere and an ocean that has got a fair amount of dissolved oxygen. And as you're going to see, and again, as I'm sure you know, it is a history of a chemical parameter that is intimately tied up with the history of the biosphere. So this is a bit of a longer talk, so I just thought I'd start by letting you know where I'm going over the next 40 minutes or so. So this is my theme, and, and I will start by introducing the motivations and some background, some fundamental concepts that will help you understand what I want to say later on. Um, I'm going to take a lot of time for this because I realize this is a diverse geochemical audience, so I'm going to spend almost half the talk on this background and motivation. Um, and I should say now that what I say in this first part of the talk has nothing to do with me or my group. It's the work of many people over, over decades. But then I'm going to go on to talk about something that is my core business, something that we have been closely involved in, and that is how we use trace metal isotopes to understand the history of ocean oxygenation. And I'm going to start with molybdenum, second row transition metal, and its isotope system as an example. And most of what I say in this part is published, relatively recently published, but it is published. And, some, and many of you will probably know a little bit about it already. And then finally, I'm going to move on to something very new that is really not, has not been uh, published. The record, the, the, the Phanerozoic data I'm going to show you has not been published. And uh, it uh, involves another isotope system that we've been heavily involved with developing nickel isotopes and I'm going to use nickel isotopes as another example and show you maybe how two of these isotope systems together is much more powerful, surprise, surprise, than one. And when I get to that latter part of the talk, the work that I will be describing has not been done by me. It's been done by uh, PhD students and postdocs in, in the lab in Zurich and previously actually in Bristol. and. Uh, Two of them are here, Ming Shao Sun and Sarah Fleischmann are here and, and have been presenting and will be presenting. <clears throat> so let me start off with something uh, all of you, I am sure, have seen before. This is a very famous diagram now. It shows an outline history of what the concentration of O2 has done in the Earth's atmosphere over Earth history. So there are um, 
Two scales on the left is absolute uh, partial pressure of oxygen. They're both log scales though. And on the right is that absolute partial pressure, but normalized to the present atmospheric level. So we're up at uh, one at, at the present day. And so what we know for sure about this atmospheric history is that the Earth started with an atmosphere that had very little O2 in it, essentially none, very small amounts. And that continued until, well, there, there, there are, there's debate about whether there were whiffs of oxygen before, but uh, the really big change happened at something called the Great Oxidation Event about halfway through Earth history, when there really was a major change in the amount of oxygen in the atmosphere, a big, a big jump. The details are more hazy, whether it went up to a peak and then came down again, or whether it stayed up, not at, not at present levels, but at sort of intermediate levels during the Proterozoic uh, is, is a matter of debate. And it's also fair to say that the proximate cause, the reason why the GOE happened when it did, is also debated. Um, this is all about sources and sinks of oxygen in the atmosphere to make the great oxidation event happen you could decrease the sink of oxygen in the atmosphere. And, and back then, the main sink was reductant volatiles coming from the mantle. And there's a, there's a, a, a school of thought that that's what changed at the time of the GOE, that the, the, in the re reducing state of the volatiles coming from the mantle changed. But one thing is certain, that sink may have changed, but you needed a source of oxygen to make the GOE happen at all, either at the time of the GOE or before it. And the biggest source that we, of oxygen, way bigger than any other that we know about today is oxygenic photosynthesis. This uh, is a simple chemical reaction that describes it. It's the metabolism by which plants uh, split water, take the hydrogen and combine it with CO2 to make a carbohydrate in their cells and oxygen O2 is made as a byproduct. That's not all you need to do. You then need to get rid of, of um, that reductant uh, it, or this reaction will reverse. And the way it's conventionally thought that we get rid of that reductant is by taking the organic carbon produced ultimately and burying it in rocks before the oxygen can be used up again by the reverse reaction. So this is a biological reason why the GOE happened. It may not be the proximate cause. There's a lot of debate about when oxygenic photosynthesis evolved, but it's a necessary condition. It's a permissive cause of the GOE. And then we had another long period of stasis. It's become known as the boring billion when uh, oxygen stayed low, probably. And then there was a second rise. Um, again, the, the timing and the causes are debated. It may have been in the late Precambrian or in the early Paleozoic, um, but there is a biological angle to this rise as well, because it seems that it can't be a coincidence that when molecular oxygen in the atmosphere rose to pretty much present levels, and then it varied a bit after that, but not much, at least on this scale, that was also the time when we had the explosive emergence in the Cambrian radiation of complex multi multicellular animal life, which of course needs oxygen to respire. So this is a history of a chemical variable at the surface of the Earth that is both forced by the biosphere and has feedbacks to the biosphere. So this is very much tied up with the history and evolution of the biosphere. So how did geochemist establish that history. I just thought I'd say one general thing to introduce the concept, the overall concept of how this is done. And it's a topical example. This is a picture of Hawaii. It's two basalt flows. The older one underneath is red. The top one is black. The reason the, un the one underneath is red is because it's rusted. It was, a, it was erupted into uh, an atmosphere, beneath an atmosphere that is, contains oxygen. And what happens to make it go red in very simple terms is, is just shown by this reaction. Under, the, under our oxic atmosphere today, igneous minerals like olivine, for example, weather oxidatively. The iron in olivine and many igneous minerals is iron too, the reduced form of iron. When the mineral olivine breaks down, the iron is released. But under our oxic atmosphere today, it doesn't stay in solution as iron too and get washed into groundwater and rivers, it is very quickly oxidized to iron three, and iron three is very insoluble, and that, and that iron three precipitates as a secondary mineral in soils. 
So if we didn't know it already, the fact that that basalt is red is telling us that it was erupted under an oxic atmosphere. And people have used this in more, it, it's more complicated, of course, than I've just explained, but uh, people have used this to set limits, lower, as you see from the arrows here, and upper limits on the concentration of oxygen in the atmosphere through time. And that if using paleo soils, using old soils, and uh, the degree to which they've lost iron, the degree to which they've, they've retained iron. So that's a direct way in which atmospheric oxygen can be uh, concentrations or some limits on atmospheric oxygen concentrations can be obtained in the past. But actually, most of the evidence through which we understand surface earth redox in general comes from ocean sediments. So this picture is a section with depth on the y-axis. The line of section is in the map at the bottom left from the North Atlantic all the way down the Atlantic, around Antarctica, and then up the Pacific. And the colors and numbers show dissolved O2 concentrations in micromoles per kilogram. The darker colors are lower oxygen, the lighter colors are more. And so you can use the amount of oxygen in the surface ocean and what that amount of oxygen does to the redox state of sediments deposited in the surface ocean to understand the atmosphere, because the surface ocean is fairly directly controlled, its oxygen concentration is fairly directly controlled by simple Henry's law partitioning with the oxygen rich atmosphere. So you can do that, and, and it, it's, I think, fair to say that most of the constraints on surface earth redox have come from ocean sediments, iron, the state of uh, oxidation of iron or sulfur or whatever. So that's one reason that ocean oxygenation as history is important. Um, we learn about the atmosphere, we learn about the surface earth redox state in general, but of course this is important, ocean oxygenation is important in its own right. So for example, both primitive and complex life on earth evolved first in the ocean. So the forcers of oxygenation, the oxygenic photosynthesizers started in the ocean and uh, the complex animal life that had first appeared in this spectacular radiation in the Cambrian was all in the ocean. So ocean oxygenation is important um, and ocean anoxia is not good for life in general during the Phanerozoic. And this history isn't over. Um, there's significant concerns about future deoxygenation of the oceans in the face of anthropogenic change. Warming of the earth will stratify the oceans and uh, inputs of, of, uh, of nutrients from agricultural land will stimulate productivity, which we'll see in a minute, control ocean ox oxygen. And it's also the case that the oxygenation of the interior, the deep ocean, is not simply related to the atmosphere. It's become increasingly clear that it occurred later than the oxygenation of the atmosphere, and it's not a one-way street. It went back and forth. So, just to uh, keep you on the same page as me, let me just simply introduce what controls O2 abundance in the deep ocean. So I've already told you that surface concentrations are at least mostly controlled by the partitioning of oxygen between the aqueous phase of the oceans and the gas phase of the atmosphere. But the deep ocean is controlled mostly by two other things. First of all, there's a source of dissolved oxygen to the deep ocean. And the source is simply the sinking of oxygen-rich atmosphere equilibrated water from the surface. Ocean circulation, that's a conve convectively driven largely and where water is sinking like the North Atlantic and around Antarctica, the deep ocean tends to be more oxygen rich. So there's a source to the deep ocean. There is also a sink, however. So the photic zone of the oceans is where photosynthesis happens, where uh, phytoplankton photosynthesize and manufacture organic matter. But that uh, organic matter eventually falls into the deep ocean where it's eaten by animals, but actually mostly, most important here, bacteria. And they use oxygen in the same way that you do. They use oxygen to respire that food that's produced by photosynthesis at the surface. And uh, they, they, uh, they, they consume O2 as a result. This is called the biological pump, of course. It also pumps uh, CO2, it also pumps carbon away from the surface uh, 
surface ocean and atmosphere and into the deep ocean, and perhaps even as organic matter into the sediment if, this, if it escapes respiration like this. So there are sources and sinks of O2 in the, in the deep ocean, which control oxygen concentrations there. And both of these, they're controlled by tectonics, but they're at least in part controlled by climate. So if you have hot climates, you have a warm upper ocean, it doesn't convectively overturn as readily. If you have a hot climate, you tend to have a lot of chemical weathering on the continents. That chemical weathering supplies essential nutrients to the photosynthesizing organisms in the surface, like phosphate, for example, and chemical weathering proceeds generally speaking, more rapidly under warm climates than, than cold. So what would happen then if this went further? What would happen if the deep ocean did run out of oxygen? You can see that there's no part of the ocean, the open ocean today, that has run out of oxygen. But what it, if, if this went slightly further, it could. What would happen then? So I've taken a lot of diagrams from two, two very nice reviews by Brian Kendall recently, and this is, this is one of them. And what, what happens is that the chemistry of the ocean changes fundamentally when it goes anoxic. So the aerobic respiration that uh, you do and a lot of aer an aerobic bacteria do can't happen when the deep oceans are anoxic. There's no O2 for it to happen. So what happens instead is that bacteria breathe other things. They use other oxidants to oxidize the organic matter. So some use sulfate, bacterial sulfate reduction, and as a result of that, they get, the, you know, they get some energy in the same way that they do from aerobic respiration. The sulfate is transformed into sulfide, and that's extremely important for ocean chemistry. It's extremely important for ocean biology because sulfide is toxic to animals. And microbes can even breathe, if you like, iron oxide instead of O2. So you, they can use iron oxide as the oxidant that oxidizes the organic matter of food to release energy. And so when the ocean goes anoxic in the deep, it doesn't just go anoxic, it will either go sulfitic or ferruginous, iron rich, because one, the consequence of uh, that reaction at the bottom, the red one, is that you release iron as a soluble iron two iron. And we can see this happening in some strange locations today. It's not, doesn't happen in the open ocean. But, uh, for example, we can see one of these metabolisms really dominating the deep chemistry of the Black Sea. The Black Sea is a small ocean basin that is stratified. It's got a, a thin layer of fresher water on the top. Fresher water is less dense than salty water, so there isn't much impetus for convective overturn. So the Black Sea is undersupplied with oxygen from the atmosphere via the usual supply route. And it quickly runs out by 100 meters, it's all gone. And in the deep black sea, this metabolism of bacterial sulfate reduction takes over and you have a lot of dissolved H2S, dissolved sulfide in the black sea as a result. <clears throat> so if we then go back to the history now with that sort of background and say, well, what, would the ocean, what, what do we expect the oceans to look like before O2 was high at the surface of the Earth um, and they were anoxic, what we, we would expect is for the oceans to either be sulfitic or ferruginous. And it is these two redox couples that have been most heavily used at the sort of the, the diagram at the, at the bottom left is shows uh, the uh, point on the PE scale where the two redox couples undergo their transformation. And most of the work on ocean oxygenation has uh, used these two, these two redox couples. And this is a diagram from a paper by Eric Sperling, where he has compiled a lot of data. And he suggested that we went through the transition from sulfidic and ferruginous oceans to something else, um, coupled with atmospheric ox oxygenation, maybe in the middle Paleozoic. But of course, there's a long way to go after that. That transition of, is, of course, important. But then the other question is, what happens next? We're up on that redox scale. We're over at the left today, right? So how did we get there and when did we get there? So as an example of taking this further, so we, it's clear that ocean oxygenation continued after that major transition in the middle Paleozoic. Uh, but it also continued to be dynamic. There, 
famously, the Mesozoic Ocean Oceanic Anoxic events um, suggest that it went back and forth. And how do we, how could we study that? Well, um, the, I'm having trouble here with this. Okay, uh, so there's been a lot of work in the last sort of 10 years or so on this redox couple, the iodate iodide couple. So in oxidizing conditions, the element iodine exists as iodate. In reducing conditions, it exists as iodide. And one important thing here is that it is only iodate. Iodate can substitute into calcium carbonate, right? Iodide cannot. So one might say we could use iodine calcium ratios of calcium carbonate to look at how big the iodate pool was in the past ocean. And people have done this, and this shows iodine calcium ratios in marine carbonate for two, three time periods. And you can see that the uh, iodine calcium ratios continue rising after the Paleozoic. And in fact, uh, it's hidden on that diagram on the right, but they continue to rise after the Mesozoic and into the Cenozoic. So iodine calcium ratios are changing uh, a lot, much later in Earth history than that transition in the Paleozoic. So and we now have an, ocean, an atmosphere that's more or less fully oxic. So the two things that must be controlling uh, the further oxygenation and the periodic return to anoxia that we see, for example, in OAEs, must be, be controlled by these two things, the green and, and the red arrows, as I explained earlier. Okay, so before I move on to validity, let me just, you know, summarize quickly what I've just said. So the redox state of the ocean continued to change after the atmosphere was fully oxic and it was dynamic. It wasn't a one-way street. There are periodic returns to anoxia like in the Mesozoic. It's in part controlled by the biosphere. For example, the nature and strength of the biological pump will control how much food is delivered to the deep ocean and therefore how much there is to be respired to use oxygen. But there are feedbacks, of course, to the biosphere. It's well known that these periodic oceanic, oceanic anoxic events in the, in the Phanerozoic are associated with mass extinctions. Um, it's, there are multiple controls, but I suppose it's fair to say that climate is a master control on all of this, to some extent at least. So for example, the oceanic anoxic events are thought to be triggered, often at least, by large igneous provinces. Eject, injection of greenhouse CO2 in, into the atmosphere causing warming, that causes ocean stratification, it causes lots of chemical weathering on the continents and nutrient delivery to the ocean. But there are feedbacks also to the surface earth generally. When you have oceanic anoxia, it's easier to bury organic carbon, right? Because it doesn't, there's not much oxygen to respire it. And so that takes uh, carbon out of the ocean atmosphere system, but it also puts oxygen into the ocean atmosphere system. So there are feedbacks in all directions. Okay, so that was some background. Let me now move on to something that is my core business, and that's molybdenum and its isotopes. So, and trace metal isotopes generally, and how we can use them to understand the history of ocean oxygenation. So molybdenum, as you will all know, is a second row transition metal. There it is. And what you're going to see in the next part of the talk for the two isotope systems that I'm going to talk about at least is that what we're going to learn from, from them is when conditions get oxidizing enough for manganese to be oxidized in the ocean. And you'll find out a bit later why, why that is. But this, is, this is, turns out to be the key thing that we're going to learn. Um, as I'll explain from these trace metal isotope systems, the two that I'm going to talk about at least. So molybdenum, um, here's a pH EH diagram from molybdenum, and uh, it's, it's not completely certain, but it appears that molybdenum is always molybdenum-6 at the surface of the earth, at least in, in the oceans. And so you might ask, well, what can it tell us about redox then? It turns out it can, and here's the reason. So in the open oxic ocean today, molybdenum is speciated as an oxyanion, a molybdate oxyanion, in the oxic conditions of the open ocean. This molybdate ion is extremely soluble, extremely stable, extremely inert, and it has a long residence time in the oceans. The thing that makes uh, 
uh, and molybdenum is the, is the transition metal with the highest concentration of all the transition metals in the ocean, higher than iron, right, which should, again shows you how important redox is, right? Molybdenum is present at PPM levels in the continental crust, iron's a major element, but there's two orders of magnitude more molybdenum dissolved in the ocean than there is iron. Um, it becomes interesting from a redox point of view, sort of indirectly, because when, you, when conditions get sulfidic, and remember conditions get sulfidic when the oceans become anoxic, and bacterial sulfate reduction takes over as a dominant bacterial metabolism, when, it, when conditions get sulfidic, and I know George Helt is in the audience and he's done a lot of this, um, the oxygens in the molybdate ion are replaced by sulfur, atoms and you form a thiomolybdate ion instead, MOS4, and that very unlike, completely differently from, from molybdate is extremely insoluble and is very quickly removed from solution. Uh, how exactly it's removed from solution is another thing that George is uh, very interested in and, and there's a debate about how exactly it happens, but we know it happens that it is removed from solution. All right, so more reducing conditions when there's sulfide around, we will uh, get removal of molybdenum because it, the sulfur species is very insoluble. So we, we and others, many, many others, have measured molybdenum concentrations in the open ocean. It's a pretty thankless and boring task, as you can see. The, it's a, it's a well-mixed uh, element in the ocean because it's got this very long residence time and the oceans mix much faster. So the concentrations are constant, as I say, very high, the highest transition metal abundance is in the ocean. And we can measure the isotope uh, composition of that dissolved pool of molybdenum. So there are multiple isotopes of molybdenum. We talk about the stable isotope system in terms of the 98-95 ratio expressed in the usual delta notation. And again, the isotope composition of molybdenum, as you'd expect, long residence time in the ocean is homogeneous and it's heavy. It's isotopically heavy. And the interesting thing, the thing that makes molybdenum interesting in the oceans for a redox point of view, oh, first of all, I should say that everything we do uh, uh, in trying to understand Earth history, chemical sediments formed in the ocean in Earth history depends on a really sound knowledge of the modern ocean. Without that, we wouldn't be able to do any of this. And that knowledge of the modern ocean has been revolutionized by this international geotraces program uh, in, in recent years, and we've really learned so much that we didn't know before. Okay, so the molybdenum isotope composition of the dissolved pool today is heavy, and the interesting thing about that is that that oceanic reservoir is not the same isotope composition as the inputs to the ocean, which are dominated by rivers. There, it's quite a lot heavier. Why should that be? Why should the reservoir be heavier than the inputs? There's only one way it can be. There must be a preferential removal of the light isotope into one of the sinks. And we know what that sink is through the work of uh, uh, some of the people at the bottom there, and Laura, also Laura Vasilenki, who I think is also in the audience, um, through measurements uh, of um, deep sea oxic sediments we find that molybdenum associated with manganese oxides in those sediments in the oxic uh, open ocean is isotopically lighter than the input and isotopically lighter than the oceanic dissolved pool. So it's the removal of molybdenum in this sink in the open ocean that's preferentially removing the light isotope and that is pushing the oceans towards heavy isotope compositions. And this happens through the slow absorption of molybdenum, preferentially the light isotope, to manganese oxides uh, that are precipitating in the oxic open ocean because manganese is, ox is quickly oxidized in the, in, in the oxic open ocean today. If the oceans were reducing, manganese would be in its reduced form, which is soluble. But then in the Black Sea, as I told you, and when you get sulfidic conditions, molybdenum does something completely different. So if, when we go into the Black Sea and we go into the deep Black Sea where it's sulfidic, there's lots of dissolved sulfide, we see something very different. We see that molybdenum concentrations decline markedly in the sulfidic portion. And the reason is that the molybdate has been transformed to a thiomolybdate. It's very insoluble, gets removed from solution, and uh, concentrations decline. That process is really quite efficient, as you can see. And when we look at the Black Sea sediment and the molybdenum isotope composition of the Black Sea sediment, what we see is this. 
what we what we see what we see happening is we see the creation of a heavy pull at last topically heavy pull molybdenum in the oxic open ocean it's fed into the Black Sea, that heavy pool with lots of molybdenum, and the Black Sea just pulls it all out, almost all of it out. And as a result, the sediment in the Black Sea is isotopically the composition of the water that's fed in because there's quant nearly quantitative removal. And that's cool, right? The Black Sea is itself sulfidic, but it's telling you that there's somewhere else on Earth, if you only had the Black Sea, it's telling you that somewhere, somewhere else on Earth that molybdenum is being removed by this oxic process. So this is a diagram which sort of summarizes our current knowledge of the, the isotopic mass balance of molybdenum in the ocean. So the, the scale here is the delta 98 molybdenum scale. The thickness of the arrows on here is supposed to schematically denote the size of the input there, or at the bottom, the outputs of to oxic sediments or euxinic sediments. So again, um, we have so far we have these two sinks. I said that there was quantitative removal of molybdenum in the deep Black Sea, and therefore the deep Black Sea sediments were very close to the modern open ocean dissolved pool. There are other euxinic basins where that's, not, that's less true, it's maybe not quite as efficient removal. And so we think that overall, sulfidic conditions produce sediments that are at that, at that orange arrow there. <clears throat> now there is another sink of molybdenum in the ocean, actually it's the biggest sink. Um, it occurs at upwelling margins, really productive upwelling margins, like off the coast of Peru and Namibia today, where you have upwelling water bringing lots of nutrients into the surface ocean, lots of photosynthesis, lots of primary productivity producing organic matter. And uh, for reasons that I'll explain in a bit more detail at the end of the talk, there is molybden, a lot of molybdenum in those sediments and its isotope composition has been measured. But the main thing, the main point I wanna make here is that the oxic open ocean sink, that blue arrow, Sorption to manganese oxide, which remember only occurs when you have an oxic open ocean, is what drives the modern oceanic dissolved pool to isotopically heavy values. Before I leave this slide, if you, if you, if you, you can imagine if you were to measure sediments uh, all over, the, obviously if you measure sediments all over the current ocean, you get a range of isotopic values from molybdenum, depending on what kind of sediment it is. It is, just as these sinks and outputs show. However, you never, there's no process that we know of that produces a molybdenum isotope composition in sediment that is heavier than the aqueous, the dissolved pool from which it comes. Now, a few years ago, a PhD student of mine, Zi Chen, compiled and measured, I'm focusing on the top panel here, compiled and measured molybdenum isotope data for all kinds of sediments through the last three and a half billion years of Earth history. And there's a lot of variability in the data. You expect that variability because we know that sediments can record different uh, molybdenum isotope compositions. But the point Zi Chen made is that the first time in Earth history when we, met, when we see uh, a sediment that has the same molybdenum isotope composition as the modern oceanic dissolved pool is in the early Cambrian. Um, so what that means is it was only in the early Cambrian that we had a, a big enough manganese oxide sink to take out enough light molybdenum to push the dissolved pool up to high values. And, uh, and so, I mean, you might say, well, we're missing some data. It depends on the quality that you know, there may be some gaps, but that's what we see from this data set as, as it is here. And of course, it's very hard to avoid the speculation and the conclusion that it cannot be a coincidence that the first time molybdenum starts to, see, to, 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 to be impacted by this oxic sink is exactly the time when animal complex multicellular animal life that critically depends on molecular O2 exploded on earth now there's a lot of debate about again about whether the 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 it was oxygen that was the proximate cause of this explosion of animal life in the early cambrian but you know that's kind of a coincidence and it's an intriguing coincidence and i i personally think there's more to it than a, than a coincidence um <clears throat> and other people have made the same point this paper from brian kendall came out uh, a little bit later than z, uh, than z chen's and he he found the same thing there at the the precambrian cambrian boundary is the first time delta 98 molybdenum molybdenum in any sediment records the value of the modern ocean so again the first time you had something pulling out light molybdenum. 
There are some other views on this. For example, uh, Tay Stahl um, has suggested a different timing for this transition in the Libdenum isotopes as late as the Devonian. Um, and I saw a selenium isotope talk yesterday by Kip and college, colleagues, which hints at transient oxygenation, at least it hints to me, of transient oxygenation in the early Cambrian, but then a return to anoxia until the Devonian, which would be <clears throat> perhaps uh, consistent with all of this. The other thing that Ji Chan tried to do was to assess what this result might mean quantitatively. And he did this through <clears throat> a very simple mass balance approach. So the top equation there really very simply says, <clears throat> if the ocean is in steady state from molybdenum abundance, then the amount that comes in from rivers must go out again in the sinks. In other words, the amount of the sinks, total burial in sinks must equal the input or the sizes, the fractional sizes of the sinks must sum to one. The second equation is an isotope mass balance equation. It just says that the isotope composition of each sink weighted by the size of that sink must again equal the input. What comes in must go out again. And uh, the problem with these two equations is that there's um, one more uh, var variable and we have constraints. So Zichen had to introduce this other thing, K, which he called K, which was, the fractional size of the oxic sink relative to the total non euxinic sink or oxic plus upwelling. And then he explored the parameter space to see what was possible and what was not possible. And this is the result, one of the results. So what is plotted here is solutions to those equations for F, the fractional size of the euxinic sink on, along the X axis and the value of K along the Y axis and it's contoured for seawater isotope composition. So remember today we're at plus 2.34. So in order to get plus 2.34, what this is suggesting is that we must be somewhere on this black contour and we must have been somewhere on that black contour in the early Cambrian because it was also plus 2.34, um, if you believe what we're doing here. And then the other thing he did was to say, okay, what's, what's the, the molybdenum isotope composition, the highest sediment we find and therefore the maximum seawater can be before the Cambrian, and that's about the red contour, 1.4. So you can see this is not going to give us a unique solution. All we know is we're moving from the red contour to the black contour as we cross the pre-Cambrian-Cambrian -Cambrian boundary. So we could have done any one of these uh, three things. Um, Zi Chen concluded based on this and other constraints that it uh, it sort of has to be the horizontal RO that is most important here, a decrease in the size of the euxinic sink. And that's what happened, perhaps, at the pre-Cambrian-Cambrian -Cambrian boundary. So you can see there's a problem of non-uniqueness. We can't get a completely final solution to this problem. There's another problem, though, with molybdenum, and that is it originates in the fact, first point out, pointed out by Hong Fei Ling, who's Zi Chen's other supervisor, and that is the euxinic sink is massively more efficient than the other sinks at taking molybdenum out of seawater. Now, what that means is that the, if you, today we have a Black Sea, a Carioco Basin, a few other small euxinic basins, but the area of the sea floor that's euxinic is tiny today, right? But that area is still quite important to the molybdenum budget. It's important because it, that kind of condition pulls out a load of molybdenum. It's a, it, the the, the uh, amount of molybdenum buried per unit area in euxinic, euxinic settings is huge compared to oxic settings. So we have one black sea today. You might say, look, uh, and it's a very tiny, tiny area of the ocean floor. We could have 10 or 20 black seas in the past, and we would massively affect the molybdenum isotope budget, right? Uh, and, and 10 or 20 Black Seas is still not a huge area of euxinic ocean, but it's really important for how molybdenum behaves because this sink is so efficient. Okay, so if you plot fractional euxinic area versus the molybdenum isotope composition of seawater, you can see it's really nonlinear. Uh, it's really sensitive at the low end of fractional uh, area and very, very insensitive at the top end. So this is a complex problem. It demands a multi-pronged approach. I'm not the first person to say this. This is another nice diagram from one of Brian Kendall's papers. And the point that Brian is making here is that we have lots of tracers. They're all telling us slightly different things. We should use them. It's not 
rocket science to say that. We need a multi-pronged approach. Um, and in the case of molybdenum, we would like to try and solve the non-uniqueness problem. And we'd like to, to find another tracer that is not quite so sensitive to the euxinic sink and could tell us uh, with a bit more granularity what's going on. And people are doing this. What I'm going to do here is something slightly different. Um, I'm going to show you now, I'm going to finish with a tracer that looks qualitatively similar to molybdenum does very similar looking things in the modern ocean, modern ocean sinks. But the quantitative partitioning between different sinks is different. And actually, it turns out that the behavior, the detailed behavior of the sinks is slightly different. And that element is nickel, another transition metal. This is a very, this is rather a new isotope system. It's one that we're currently working on trying uh, to understand, but we're at the level of understanding now where I think we can go into the past and maybe do something useful. So let's look at seawater first. So here's nickel isotopes in the oceanic dissolved pool today. And again, this is thanks to geotraces that we have these samples that can measure this. So the isotope ratio is a 60-58 ratio expressed in the delta notation as usual. There's data for all the ocean basins here. There are interesting things going on in the photic zone where nickel isotopes get heavy. I'm not going to focus on that today. I think Seth John might be giving his, his, view, his view of the water column nickel isotopes later on today. I'm going to focus on something else. I'm going to focus again on the fact that the, uh, the, the dissolved pool of the oceans is isotopically heavy relative to the inputs, just like molybdenum. And just like molybdenum, this must be caused by a light sink. That's the only way that can happen. Again, this is our current understanding of the nickel isotope budget of the ocean. It's a work in progress, that's for sure. And there's some things we have to work out, but there seem to be three sinks, the same as for molybdenum, at least geographically the same as molybdenum. And again, though, what I want to point out is it is the oxic open ocean sink sorption to manganese oxide and nickel sorbs very, very strongly to manganese oxide is what is driving the modern oceanic dissolved pool to isotopically heavy values relative to the input. And the other thing I just uh, point out is that the upwelling sink on uh, this occasion is really very, we've measured it now in, in Namibia and Peru, and in both cases, it's very close to the modern open ocean nickel isotope composition. So um, <clears throat> that if we could find upwelling sediments in the past, we could get at perhaps the ocean isotope composition of nickel in the past. So my current student, Ming Xiao Sun, who talked yesterday, but you can watch the video, has been doing just that. Again, he's been measuring old sediments for nickel isotopes. He's been trying to target upwelling zones. That's quite, sometimes can be quite difficult because what we can measure that tell us it might be an upwelling zone in an ancient sediment is that it's rich in organic carbon. But in restricted settings are also rich, like the Black Sea, are also rich in organic carbon. So it's not the only, you need to look for other things. Sometimes we can use what we know of the paleogeography. Sometimes we can use other things. I'm not going to go into the details of these data. So it's nickel isotopes versus time. I want to point out one important thing, I think, is that we don't see modern seawater values of nickel isotope compositions in these sediments, in any sediment, until really late in Earth history, probably into the Cenozoic. And that's really late, right? Stupidly late, probably, for people who work on ocean redox. Um, but uh, I would just point out also that the ma so you know now that this is controlled by the manganese oxide sink. That redox couple from manganese is quite close to the iodate iodide redox couple. And this is just a bit of fun. I'm not really taking this seriously, but I think it's interesting that when you compare that nickel isotope record to the iodine calcium record of the Phanerozoic, there are kind of similarities. This is really early days for nickel isotopes. So, but for example, iodine calcium has never shown higher values throughout the Phanerozoic than it does in the Cenozoic. Uh, there, it shows very low values in the Mesozoic, just like nickel. And the tops of both of these diagrams would point to, towards more oxidizing conditions. So that's kind of interesting. But again, what does this result mean quantitatively? So I'm going to show you, do the same analysis as I did for molybdenum, but this time it's for nickel. So uh, we uh, <clears throat> have contours of nickel isotope composition of seawater, uh, and molybdenum is on the left again. The green dots are where we think we are today, 
in the modern ocean, right? We have very small euxinic sinks um, and, uh, well, quite small euxinic sinks and uh, K-oxic is different for the different elements because the efficiency of uptake into the sinks is, is different. Um, but we are, um, we, we are on plus 1.33 is the modern seawater nickel isotope composition. It appears that before the Cenozoic, if you believe that record, if you believe that record is sampling the maximum isotope composition of nickel in any period in the past, then we have to be, we have, what we have to do to explain the past for nickel is to bring the K value right down the ratio between the oxic sink and the oxic plus upwelling sink, right? That's the only way to get to nickel isotope compositions that we see on this diagram before the Cenozoic. We have to bring K right down, but we are not allowed to bring K for molybdenum down because molybdenum, we think, all the way through the Mesozoic and Cenozoic, except perhaps during the heights of, of the periodic oceanic and oxic events, was always on that black contour to plus 2.34, right? So how do we bring K for nickel down without bringing K for molybdenum down? What could change that uh, ratio of those two sinks uh, to, to, to allow us to bring uh, it down for nickel, but not for molybdenum? So this, and I'm almost at my last slide now, this comes back to the details of how these various sinks work for these different elements. So here are the three sinks in a cartoon form. Upwelling margins first is a fairly simple sink for nickel. So there's water column on the top, sediment on the bottom. If you look at organic rich sediments in upwelling regions today, and Sarah Fleischmann's gonna talk about this tomorrow, there is a really strong correlation in those sediments between nickel and organic carbon concentration, stronger than any other uh, transition metal, stronger than any other metal. So we believe that the reason nickel is getting into these organic carbon rich sediments in upwelling zones is that, that the phytoplankton and the photic zone are taking nickel up, they need it, and then the organic matter is surviving all the way to the sediment. The way molybdenum is enriched in the sediment of these upwelling regions is different so molybdenum is taken up by phytoplankton too, but uh, it's not, that's not important for the oceanic budget. What happens with molybdenum is, the water column is generally speaking, at least until the very bottom, more or less oxic in these, these settings, but there's a load of organic matter being buried in the sediment, and that's respiration of that organic matter continues in the sediment. So instead of the water column becoming sulfitic like the Black Sea, the pore waters of the sediment eventually become sulfitic at depth. And when they become sulfitic, that creates a sink for when H2S goes up, that creates a sink for molybdenum because it's sulfidized. And uh, there's a concentration gradient that builds up between the water column, in the pore waters between the water column and the sink, and molybdenum literally diffuses down that concentration gradient and gets fixed at that uh, point of depth. Then the euxinic sink, molybdenum is really, well, not simple, but it's simpler than nickel. Uh, in the upper oxic portion of the Black Sea, molybdenum exists as a molybdate ion, in the lower portion as a thiomolybdate, and that's removed very strongly from solution. Nickel is a bit more complicated because uh, we think in the Black Sea, nickel is really strongly absorbed to manganese oxides. And uh, we think there's a particulate manganese oxide shuttle bringing nickel out from the shelves into the open Black Sea where it falls into the sulfitic region. And in that anoxic sulfitic region, the manganese oxide dissolves, releases nickel to solution, and some of that nickel is then sulfidized and ends up in the sediment. But it's this oxic open ocean sink that I think turns out to be the most complicated and the one we really have to understand a little bit better. In principle, it's simple, right? What's happening is you have an oxic water column producing oxidized manganese, particulate oxidized manganese, to which molybdenum and nickel is being absorbed. And then there's transfer of that particulate matter to the sediment, and the molybdenum and nickel is gone from, from the ocean. But and this is a problem actually for manganese that goes back 50 years uh, when people were measuring manganese contents of open ocean sediments. They found that there was way too much manganese for any budget to work in the surficial layers of these uh, sediments. And the conclusion 
uh, was that either there's another input somewhere or these sediments are losing manganese back out by they're undergoing diet the sediments are undergoing diagenetic reactions manganese is being transferred to the aqueous phase in the pore water and then it's, it's diffusing it's leaking back out to the ocean and we believe that that's happening with nickel too these fluxes back fluxes from sediment it's been realized in the last sort of 10 years that they're far more important to ocean chemistry in general than we thought before. This goes back to Catherine Jondel and Francois Lacombe with neodymium. Uh, Will Homelke was talking about benthic fluxes of iron the other day. We think there are benthic fluxes back out of the sediment caused by diagenetic reactions um, uh, within the sediment that and transferring solid phase material to pore water and then that's leaking back out. Lena Chen is talking on Friday uh, about mineral transformations that might, that, the, that might be involved in those diagenetic reactions. The other possibility is not it's also a mineral transformation, but it could, it could just simply be redox, right? It could be that that sediment um, is becoming more reducing further down, the manganese oxide is dissolving, and that will release the nickel back to the pore water. So, one way that I think that you can solve this problem that we have on here, where, where in the pre-Cenozoic, we need to be on the bottom left of that nickel diagram, decrease the size of the oxic sink relative to upwelling, whereas with molybdenum, we can't be, we need to stay on the black contour. I think one way to solve it is to change not the size of the oxic sink, but to change uh, the back flux out of the uh, of the sediment because that's really important for nickel and probably not so important for so what we would need to do is decrease the size no what we would need to do is uh, um is uh it, it increase the size of that that back flux how would we do that a bigger back flux in the pre-cenozoic well that if this is redox controlled it's quite simple you just need to, in the pre-Cenozoic, have less oxygen penetration into the sediment. I saw another talk yesterday uh, where someone was suggesting that bioturbation, which is really important to oxygenation of the upper sediment, probably really only got going in a big way in the Mesozoic, really in a really big way in the Mesozoic. Um, or you could bury, you could change the amount of organic carbon you bury because that is the fuel. That is the fuel for the redox reactions uh, like and other diagenetic reactions too, probably that uh, could uh, transfer the nickel to pore water and uh, let it back out. And Elizabeth is waiting for me to finish, and I'm finished. Okay, so just finish with one slide on outlook. We're still at an early stage in the development of nickel isotopes, <clears throat> but the combination of similarities and contrasts with molybdenum suggests potential in coupled applications. There are still things we need to understand, and we're actively working on that. The other thing I'd say at the end is just to make one general point. The trace metal community have become really good at measuring stuff, making observations, and there are lots of different tracers and lots of different kinds of data that we have now. This has started, but I think uh, we have made less progress in understanding what the observations mean quantitatively. I mean, I'm still at this simple mass balance level that you sh you, I showed you earlier. And we, we, again, this has started, but we require a more sophisticated modeling approach. We require the involvement of Earth system modelers to really tell us what our data uh, might mean. And we, we have so much data now that it might be worth contemplating the idea of of data inversion, of data of inversion of a whole load of different kinds of data to try and pin down what exactly they mean. Thank you for your attention. <clears throat> Thank you, Derek, for a really lovely journey through time, geochemical uh, environments, and oceans. It hit all the high spots. Um, we have time for a couple of questions. Um, if anyone in the room would like to ask a question, please come to the microphone, and um, we'll let Derek uh, explain. Um, yes. Yeah, fascinating talk. Uh, nickel uh, can be quite toxic for biology. Have you considered, uh, on that long time scale, potential adaptation 
to toxicity to nickel in order to modify the back flux you're talking about uh, at the bottom of the ocean? Uh, I haven't considered that specifically, but you're absolutely right that a lot of these uh, trace metals in high concentrations are toxic. And um, the, the one way the ocean biosphere has of dealing with that is, is the free metal form that is bioavailable and therefore useful or toxic, depending on the concentration. And what they what tends to happen is that the toxicity is reduced by complexation of the metal with ligands that are ultimately probably of biological origin. Um, but I haven't considered the idea of toxicity of nickel in, in the context, the specific context that you've just raised. I'll think about it. Any other questions? Yeah, Laura. Hi, Derek. Thanks so much. That was fantastic. Um, just so the Zoomers know, I'm Laura Wasilenki. Um, I also work on something similar. And I wanted to ask, Derek, that you've pointed out the oxic sink overall has a value of plus 0.45 per mil, that it's light nickel that becomes associated with the manganese oxides there. But ferromanganese crusts are known to be similar in isotopic composition to seawater. Do you have any guess as to why those are different? No, I don't, and neither does anyone else, right? So to explain a little bit what, lo <clears throat> what Laura is referring to, when, when we first wanted to know what the isotope composition of, of the manganese output from the ocean, we did the easy geochemical thing. We found a ferromanganese oxide crust because there, there's nothing else except manganese oxides in it, and they're easy to measure. They're lo it's loaded up with metals. Well, I didn't do it, but other, others did. And what we found is that um, the nickel isotopes in those crusts are heavy. And this does this makes the budget the oceanic budget go crazy right and then so we thought oh god what's going on here and uh, and for a long time we were wondering and then what we started to do now though is measure the isotope composition of dispersed manganese oxides not in ferromanganese crusts in normal if you like open ocean manganese oxide rich sediment and the nickel in those sediments you can do it to try to correct you don't even need to because there's so much nickel in a lot of them and they are isotopically light which makes the budget work and the experiments it wasn't your experiment was it, it was Sorensen et al right um experiments suggest that nickel like nickel should be taken up into the manganese oxides so all of us where Gwen, you, Susan, we're all scratching our heads about why uh, crusts are heavy. We, we don't know. Sorry. <laughs> I have a question or a comment. Derek, uh, sorry, Caroline. One more. Question or comment. Okay. So Quick. thanks for plugging, too close. Thanks for plugging uh, Lena's talk on Friday. So for those of you that are still interested in this and want to find out um, why potentially crusts are heavy, then please do come to my students talk ah, on Friday. Okay. Uh, she's going to present data that we think has an explanation for this. And it's something to do, well, it's all to do with the mechanism by which the nickel is incorporated versus absorbed into the, into the, into the crust, the, the, the vernocyte mineral. So the more you uh, incorporate the nickel into the crust, the heavier the isotopic fractionation. That's the data that we have. Crusts in terms of Cenozoic age crusts, 70 million years old or, or really old, lots of time for incorporation, heavier. Whereas things that are precipitating in the water column, like for example, in the Black Sea, super young in comparison, absorption lighter. So Fantastic. we've actually got a mixing line between absorption to incorporation that kind of would explain the data that you guys are, are looking at. And of course, you partially know this because we're doing the isotope um, work with Derek because we can't do it at Leeds. So um, yeah, but if you're still interested in this, then yeah, please come along to Lena's talk. Well, that's good news. I think if, if anyone has any further questions or discussions, you can come to the meet the speaker afterwards. And I want to thank everyone for coming. And given that we, and thank Derek for a great talk. And I just, in closing, I want to say, yeah, thank you. And I just want to close by saying we started this plenary with the uh, Fellows Awards. And so um, it's the nominations that make 
the awards because without a nomination, we don't know who to honor. And there is a award nomination session and workshop right following this in room 319. You're welcome to come even if you didn't sign up ahead of time. And with that, enjoy the rest of the day and we'll see you here tomorrow.